like a sauna. The room was dark, hot, and humid. Even the rats were hungry. They kept going for the blood and the human flesh from all the open wounds. Both men were naked, except for their underwear. The old man had a lot of white and fluffy hair. The young man was scared, sobbing, screaming. The pain in his knee was so terrible that he had to be wincing even as he was crying. The older man leans over and whispers in Arabic, Hang in there, son. This is just going to be a story to tell one day. You will tell the story. So make it a story worth telling. Four years later, the old man is dead. He was tortured and buried in a mass grave. The young man stands before you. And this is his story. I want you to imagine that where I'm standing right now is an underground, windowless room, just bigger than this carpet. The lights are turned off. Everything is dark and black. As I am thrown into this room, the prison guard parks, that is your spot, and slams the door shut. I can't see my spot. It's so dark, I can't see anything. Rats hissing and chattering. Men crying openly. Some are screaming. Others are breathing heavily, gasping for air. I keep bumping into sweaty human flesh. It is so hot here that even the cement under my bare foot is warm. After a while, a tiny crack, just the size of a pinhole, opens up in the ceiling. And a tiny ray of bluish yellow sunshine streams in. In the moments that follow, I discover something incredible. The tiniest ray of light coming into the darkest room will gradually fill the entire room with light. But the reverse is impossible. No amount of darkness can overcome even a speck of light. Come to think of it, that that really is my story. The rest is just details. Before I take you back to that jail cell in Damascus, Syria, let me first take you through the gates of the building. The strange words on the gates will forever remain stuck in my memory. Branch 215, Raid Squad. Those who enter will be missing forever. And those who leave will be reborn again. You already know which of the two things happened to me. I was reborn. I am here. (laughs) 
as the light fills the whole room, I discover that a space this size was the jail cell for 30 prisoners. And my spot, the place where I should, where I should sit, stand, sleep, and eat from now on, is smaller than a doormat. There were many days where I was convinced that I will be missing forever. And my story will never be told. As the wounds of our torture would open up ugly holes in the naked skin of the prisoners, we could feel lice and scabies and bedbugs creep into them and suck our blood. We had to, to sleep standing. There was no space to lie down. In total, I was arrested and sent to prison three times in Syria. Altogether, I was held in seven different detention centers. In fact, on this very day, four years ago, I was being interrogated in one of them. You, you, you are very lucky to live in Canada. There are no terrorists here, except for me. Yes. That's what they called me in Syria, a terrorist. And that's why they jailed me and put me in that jail cell. Once somebody calls you a terrorist, you're in big trouble. And in Syria, it's very, be, very easy to be called a terrorist. All you have to do is oppose the government and speak out against them. I didn't even have to speak out. All I did is I took pictures of the uprising and shared them with the whole world to see. That made me a terrorist. I have always been a dreamer. But being a terrorist was not on my dreams. Like many kids, I grew up dreaming of becoming an astronaut. But when I was in high school, I lost a cousin. When I was in high school, I lost a cousin to cancer. I kept asking, why couldn't they cure her? And I kept getting the same answer. Cancer cannot be cured. So I changed my dream and made it into a mission. My mission, to become a doctor and cure cancer. That's how I ended up studying at the Faculty of Medicine in Homs, Syria, just north of Damascus. In 2011, I was a fourth-year medical student in Homs. I joined the anti-government protests that cried out for rights, change, and freedom. The movement swept across the country and became an uprising. The Assad regime tried to crush the uprising by chemical weapons, gunfire, and genocide. I ran away from Assad's bullets that day, but I didn't run away from the uprising. In fact, the next day, I went back to the streets because I felt now more than ever that it is my duty to be part of this revolution. But as you can see, there is one problem. I am quite thin and small. I have no weapons or strength to fight tanks and armies. But I have a brain, 
and I have a cell phone. And I have determination to photograph and document and expose the atrocities. Every evening, I used to go back to the university dorms and upload my videos on social media. I was so scared, and I did that under a fake name. But it worked. My videos were reaching people all across the world. After two years of anonymous videography of the uprising, I was writing a final exam for med school. Suddenly, the police storm into my classroom. They come straight for me. Somehow, they discovered that I was the one who was leaking those videos. Suddenly, I am handcuffed, blindfolded with my own shirt, and then thrown into the back of a military vehicle. After half an hour and many bruises from the hits that I received in that vehicle, we arrived in a very scary place. They unmask me, and I find myself looking at the face of a scary-looking soldier. He rips off my shirt and starts binding my hands together and string me up to a chain coming down from the ceiling. I was like this, hanging like a butcher's meat for 72 hours. And then the real torture started. They wanted me to confess and disclose the names of everybody who have ever helped me to get these videos and share them with the world. I refused to obey, so they started taking out my toenails one by one. One day, all this agony and suffering came to an end. But it was still so dangerous for me to live in Syria. My mother kept telling me that I was better off away from them than dead. And that's why I had to make that painful decision of leaving home and leaving my country. That was in 2013, four years ago. Also, that was the last time I see my family. Since then, my mother and five siblings have become refugees themselves. I escaped to Lebanon. And in Lebanon, I started working in a car wash. There was something about washing cars that made me think that I was washing all the wounds and nightmares of Syria. But washing cars was not my dream. And so I sought help from the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees, the UNHCR. What else can I do? Hope was all I had, and hope remained my best friend. A few months later, I received a phone call that changed my life and brought me here to you. A voice on the other end said, we heard your story. You might be eligible for resettlement. Are you interested? What was I going to say? No? <laughs> and here I am. Here I am in one of the best countries in the world. My mission has not changed. One day, I would still like to become a cancer specialist and fight and, fight and cure cancer. 
But first, I have work to do. There are many refugees that are suffering around the world. They have stories to tell too. They need a voice and they need a new home. And so right now, I am working full time in Vancouver as a refugee counselor. Right now, my job is to welcome other refugees to the country and to give them hope. We are all humans, but Canadians, you are superhumans. You have helped me heal all these deep wounds that I have. My hope right now is to reunite my family and to bring my mother and five siblings to Canada here to safety. Right now, they are living separately in harsh conditions across Germany and Turkey. Lucky me, I am here. I am free and with you. Whenever I talk to my mom on Skype and I see that she's starting to give up hope or maybe believing that the despair will never end, I remember the old man I met in prison and tell her, hang in there, mom. This is just one chapter of your story. Hang in there, mom. I promise you. This is all going to be a story to tell one day. Did the old man believe his own words? I will never know, because that was the last chapter of his life. But he made me believe that light always overcome darkness. There, in that hellhole, a tiny ray of light gave me hope. And a tiny ray of hope gave me light. That old man's parting words are my parting words to you. When all else is gone, remember, you still have hope. So never give up hope especially in humanity. Hope survives the worst disease. And remember, for every sad Assad rises a new Gandhi, a Mother Teresa, a Jesus. I want to add Mohammed to this list. <laughs> but you might think that I'm talking about myself. I wasn't. I was just telling you a story, and I hope you found it worth telling. <laughs>